Now, I'm going to share with you a quote uh, by author, speaker, Dave Ferguson, um, who's, who's written a book, who kind of heads up the whole exponential movement. And uh, as, as we've been going through some leadership development stuff, this quote just stuck out to me as I read it this week. He says, people who love God and who love their neighbors, people who, who Jesus calls the light of the world and the salt of the earth, make their community a better place. I'm wearing a shirt today. It says Kingswood University. It was Bethany Bible College when I went to uh, school back in those days. And uh, I remember moving to college in 2002 to Sussex, New Brunswick, Canada, to this, this little school where I could actually know everybody by name in northeastern Canada. And as I got there, I discovered something absolutely amazing about this little town. And it was the fact that they had an A&W, right? I was super excited that all the way in northeastern Canada, in this little tiny town, I found an A and W. I think that's like an American, like all American food. Like, what's it doing in Canada? I was kind of confused, but I was super excited about it at the same time because, you know, growing up, I had like an A and W mug collection. I had like the little tiny mugs. I had like this big monster mug that you could fit like two and a half cans of root beer in. I had like mugs that had French on them. I had mugs that were like platinum. I had mugs that were like uh, the 2000 edition. I had all kinds of A&W root beer mugs. And so I was ecstatic when I discovered in this little tiny town, they had an A&W. And so it just so happens that one day I decided to go down to A&W and get myself a couple of cheeseburgers, right? And, and this, uh, I didn't have a car at the time, so I had to walk. And I walked like two miles to get a couple of cheeseburgers. And I feel like that should be like a mark or just like a, a highlight if to just like a gauge if you really like cheeseburgers or if you really like A&W, the fact that you're willing to walk two miles to get cheeseburgers or go to A&W like really identifies you as someone who is an A&W fan or someone who likes cheeseburgers. And so I walk all of this distance and I, I get my two cheeseburgers and I got them in my bag and I'm, I'm walking back to campus. You know, I can't wait to eat them. I'm so excited. And as I'm walking downtown along the sidewalk, I noticed this gentleman who was dressed in what I would describe as like shabby clothes, like clothes that didn't look like they had been washed in a while. Um, he didn't look like he had, you know, uh, good hygiene practices or like he had bathed in a while. And I'm, I'm not trying to be judgmental here this morning. I'm, I'm just trying to simply share my observations. And I noticed that he was digging in trash cans. Like I could see him from a long while, a long way away. And, and while I was walking towards him, I just, he would go from trash can to trash can to trash can. And that led me to make some assumptions. Like, I wonder if this guy is, guy is hungry. Is he, is he looking for like something that he can trade or sell or, uh, you know, salvage for food? And, and I've got these two cheeseburgers in this bag and I'm getting closer to him. And all of a sudden it's like, I, I feel the spirit of God just kind of compelling me. You need to offer him a cheeseburger. And the problem is I don't want to. Okay, I got my bag with two cheeseburgers in it because I wanted two cheeseburgers. I didn't walk two miles to a w to buy two cheeseburgers so I could share one in case I met somebody along the way on my way back. I bought two cheeseburgers because I wanted two cheeseburgers. And so, like, as I'm, as I'm walking and getting closer and closer and closer to this gentleman, I, I, there's this internal conflict that is just going on inside of me, right? It's like, I don't want to give this guy two cheeseburgers. You know, maybe he's not hungry. Maybe he's just digging in the trash because that's what he likes to do. I, I don't know. And, and should I, you know, I'm coming up with all these reasons not to give this guy a cheeseburger. But it's interesting because the closer I get to him, the more like impressed on my heart it becomes that I need to give this guy a cheeseburger. And so I'm fighting and I'm wrestling and I'm fighting and I'm wrestling. And finally I get right up next to this guy. And I like, I turn and I look at him and I say, hey man, do you want a cheeseburger? And you know what happened? This is crazy. He said, no. He didn't want a cheeseburger. And like, as bad as it sounds, I was really excited about it. Okay. I was really excited that he did not want my cheeseburger. I mean, there was nothing sketchy about this. Like, I'm carrying an A&W bag that is hot 
walking away from a so it's not like this, this guy's creepy, he's offering me a cheeseburger out of the blue, this is weird. There's nothing sketchy about this. I mean, who turns down a free cheeseburger? I, I don't know, but apparently this guy did. And as I walked away, I was glad. I was like, man, I get to eat my two cheeseburgers. But I was even more glad because I was able to say yes to the Holy Spirit's prompting in my life. And really, I think about that story. It's a very simple story. But for me, that experience solidified an important principle that we discover over and over and over again in God's word. And remember, when things are repeated in the scripture, it's God's way of saying they're important. It's God's way of saying pay attention. And so here's the principle that day that was solidified for me. And it's that God wants to use us to help people. Anybody's mind blown? Right? God wants to use us to help people. You're thinking, I got out of bed for this. I came to church today. I braved COVID for this to understand that God wants to use me to help people. Tim, don't you think that's kind of obvious? Don't you think it's obvious that God wants to help me? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, it's obvious. But, you know, sometimes the most simple and obvious things to do aren't easy. They're hard. Sometimes it's hard to give. Sometimes it's hard to serve. Sometimes we don't want to give away our cheeseburger. We we just don't. Sometimes we don't want to we don't want to help people because it's going to cost us something. And as I look at our text today in 2 Kings chapter 4, um, this is what I really discover about God's heart for helping people. Three realities about the truth of how God wants to use us to help people. You see, this historical account that we're about to read takes place between 852 and 841 BC during the reign of Joram in Samaria, where a man named Elisha comes on the scene, and he's got this reputation of being a prophet from God, being somebody who declares God's word, and it's backed up by his signs and works. It's backed up. God God approves of what he says because it's backed up with miraculous works. And what we can observe early on about the account of Elisha and his ministry was that he had a heart for people. He had a desire to help. In fact, if you read in 2 Kings chapter 4, the story picks up where a wife of a certain man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. And then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour the oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. Well, she left him and and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. And when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. And she went to the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live off what is left. And my friends, as, as we read this account, we learn a very important truth right off the bat in verse 1. And that, it's that this widow who is, who is married to a, a man of God, a member of the company of prophets, a godly community of whom Elisha belonged to, this woman was in desperate need. You notice right away she was hurting. She was hurting because her husband had died, hurting because she had this great financial need. She she was hurting because her sons were about to be sold as slaves to to pay the money to those that she owed money to that she couldn't afford to pay because her husband had passed away. And if you look at this text, it doesn't sound like she earned this. She deserved this. There was choices that she had made that earned her these circumstances. Rather, it sounds like just unfortunate circumstances. And similarly, just like the widow in this story, just like her son's just like humanity as a whole has experienced and will continue to experience all around us in our neighborhoods and communities, just like in hers, just like with her, just like her sons, there are people who are hurting. There are people who are in need of God's mercy and grace. 
fact, if you think right now of someone in your life who is hurting, it's probably, it won't, probably won't take too long for you to think of somebody. Somebody who is hurting. Somebody who needs to be ministered to. This is the truth. People are hurting. The Apostle Paul highlights this for us in the New Testament in Romans 8, 19. We're inspired by the Holy Spirit. He writes, the creation, that would be us and in all, of, all of creation, waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For creation was subjected to frustration. It was broken. It was marred. We know that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. There's hurt. There's pain. Frustration. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until this present time. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around us and say things aren't the way they ought to be. There's hurt. There's brokenness. There's difficulty going on. People are hurting. We're hurting. And and we're longing for relief. We're longing for healing. We're longing for restoration. My junior year of college... I quit walking to A&W, <laughs> not because I didn't like cheeseburgers anymore, not because I was afraid I was going to run into somebody who I was going to have to give one to, but because I bought a 97 Ford Explorer with 200,000 miles on it, baby. It was a sweet ride, made me feel really manly, if you know what I'm talking. It was like this deep, woodsy, green, four-wheel drive, and I remember going up mountains, driving on two tracks, bear hunting in New Brunswick. I remember the trek 25 hours from Michigan to New Brunswick, Canada, when eventually I started hearing like these strange, weird noises coming from under the hood, like this banging around and things slamming into gear, not the way that they were supposed to be. And, you know, I had already put $3,500 into this vehicle. And as I took it to the mechanic, I found out I was going to have to put another two grand into it to rebuild the transmission. And you know college students, right? They have lots of extra money for vehicle expenses, said no one ever. Right? I mean, when, when they called me on the phone and told me how much it was going to cost, you know, my, my bear hunting, two-tracking, four-wheel four -wheel drive manly self started to cry. <laughs> I mean, like, are you serious? How am I going to do this? And I remember calling my parents on the phone, and fortunately, we were able to get it worked out. And you know, as much as I love that vehicle and, and how it transported me and my friends to all of the hockey games and all of the hunting trips and going to the restaurants and traveling to Moncton and all kinds of things, truth be known, you know, while the vehicle was supposed to serve me, reality was I was in debt to the vehicle. Reality was I was serving the vehicle. The vehicle kept me in bondage. I had, I had to fix it and fix it and fix it because things kept breaking and I just have to keep putting more and more and more money into it. It wasn't the way I wanted it to be. I was always afraid when I drove someplace that I was going to get stranded. And as I think about the vehicle and I, and I think about life, and I think about the brokenness that this, this widow experienced, how she was hurting, how she was enslaved, in bondage to her debt to the point of losing her children, it kind of makes me think to myself, what are the things in my life that are broken. Not like 97 Ford Explorers. Not, not like vehicles, but what are the things in my life that are broken? What are the relationships in my life that are broken? What are, what are the unhealthy habits in my life? What are, what are the spiritual issues that I'm dealing or not dealing with? Where do I, where do we need to experience God's healing? You know, maybe that's, maybe that's in a strained family relationship with a parent or a spouse, with a brother or a sister. Maybe that's the area where we're hurting today. Maybe it's, it's financially like the widow. You know, you've got debts. You're not sure how you're going to pay them or you're in trouble financially. You don't know where your next paycheck is coming from. And that's the area where you're hurting. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, there's a secret addiction that nobody knows about that you're trying to keep hidden and, and you're struggling with it because you're, you're afraid of, oh no, what if it comes out into the open and you're in bondage and you need to experience the freedom that Christ offers or, or you know maybe maybe it's not you at all maybe it's your neighbor maybe it's your coworker. maybe maybe it's your classmate regardless i want to share something super important super crucial for us today and that is jesus helps those who are hurting 
Jesus helps those who are hurting. He forgives. He redeems. He restores. And it's, it's not always an easy journey. It's not like give your life to Jesus and all of a sudden everything's made right. Everything is perfect. You get the good job. Your vehicle starts running. Your dog comes back. It's like when you play a country song backwards. That's not what happens when you decide to follow Jesus. Okay? But Jesus empowers you. He gives you his Holy Spirit. He makes you clean. He makes you right with him. And then things start to fall into place where they should. And here's the, here's the best part. In that healing process, God invites us and uses us to help and heal others, to help minister to and serve others who are facing the same hurt and the same brokenness that we ourselves deal with. Which kind of brings me to the second thing that we learn in this text regarding Elisha and the widow that, that is still super pertinent to us today. And that is to understand that while people are hurting, get this, we can help. Sometimes we feel like, we ever feel like you can't help? Right? If you're a child of God this morning, I want you to know no matter what circumstance presents itself to you, you can help. We can help. The church can help. If you're here visiting today and, or, or if you've been around for a while or haven't been around for a while, I want you to know that whatever problem you're facing today, God's people can help. I don't know if you're aware of this. We're uniquely qualified to deal with the struggles of this world. 2 Kings 4, 2 through 4 tells us that when Elisha heard this widow's cry, his response was, how can I help? What do you have in your house? And my friends, even if you're not sure if you can help, just to empathize with somebody who's hurting, just to, just to recognize the need and say, you know, I understand that you're hurting. I know you're going through a hard time. Let me pray for you. That goes a long way. I mean, just look at Elisha's story here. It makes this very clear when he instructs the widow to go to her neighbors and begin to ask them for empty jars. She doesn't, she, she doesn't, they don't, they don't offer like, here, here's a bunch of money to pay your debt, right? That's not what they offer. They give her empty jars. They're, they're just helping in a, in a very practical way, any way that they can. This community comes around her and begins to help. And let me remind you that this woman's husband belonged to the company of prophets. Godly men who often banded together in small communities during difficult times. Thus, one can assume that some of the people helping her out were probably these godly men, these godly families of which her husband belonged to. So we see that even in this instance, the people of God of which we know as the church today are coming alongside of this widow and partnering with God to offer her help. Bottom line, friends, we can help. We can help. We have something unique to offer. One of my uh, favorite uh, memories or times or places on campus during my college years was, was down in our old chapel. I think that's been converted into some other building now. But I used to love going to Sunday night chapel. It used to be called Body Life, but, but during my time there, they, they changed it to Encounter it, and that was always a highlight of the week. And it's weird, but I especially loved the like mile, half mile walk up and down the hill. I, it's weird because it's New Brunswick, Canada. It's snowing. It's cold. Like, I think that year it hit like negative 40 outside. I mean, it was ridiculously cold. But I used to love walking down to chapel in the crisp, clear air. And you could see all the stars and the streetlights reflecting off the snow. And there was just something incredibly peaceful about it. And I remember being in one of these services when a man walked in who I'd never seen before. Same MO, just kind of looked like he hadn't showered in a while Looked, looked like, you know, he, he didn't have the greatest clothes. And you could tell he was obviously older. And, you know, this service was usually for students, put on by students. And, and there was this gentleman there and was like, why is he there? And so the service went on and, and, and the message was given in the worship. And, you know, it came to a close and everybody's dismissed and they start leaving. And suddenly this gentleman starts talking to everybody. And finally I get up to him and I learn that he's stranded in Sussex he lives in St. John. He has no ride. It's nighttime, and he needs a place to stay. He needs some help. Talking with him, thinking, how in the world can I help? How in the world can I help? How in the world can I help? And I don't know. And, and it was just like I felt, I felt like I should do something. I felt like God specifically was asking me to do something. And so I went to our campus pastor, Pastor John, and I said, Pastor John, there's this guy here. He doesn't have a place to stay for tonight. I don't know if his story checks out or what, but I feel like God is asking me to get him a room. Do you know of any like hotels or anything like that in the area? And he said, yeah, Tim, I do. 
And I said, well, what do you think I should do? He said, well, you feel like if, if God is asking you to do this, if he's laying this on your heart, you need obedient, to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I said, okay. I said, well, look, can, I don't have a vehicle right now. Can, can you, like, take me and this guy to, to this hotel so he can get this room? And he says, yeah, and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay half the room. And so that's what we did. We, we loaded up into his vehicle. We found a hotel, and we traveled with this guy all the way to the hotel and got to learn his story. And then at the hotel, we got to pray with him and bless him in Jesus' name. Now, do you know what happened? Neither do I. That was it. I never saw this guy again in, in my life from that moment on. I don't know what happened. Were we taken advantage of? I don't know. Did this guy's story check out? I don't know. But what I do know is that I'd rather be taken advantage of than disobey the Holy Spirit's leading in my life. And my friends, I'm sure many of you have had similar experiences. And while we may not be able to meet everyone's needs all the time, we can meet some of the needs some of the time. We can do something. You know, this widow's neighbors, they just gave her jars. Super easy to do, right? We can do something like Elisha, like the company of prophets, like the widow's neighbors, to play a role in helping out those who are hurting around us. If you get nothing else out of the message, get this today. We can help. We can help. And we can play this role both individually as, as persons. We can play this role as families. We can play this role collectively as a church or groups of churches. And in fact, this is actually a, a key factor in churches that are growing and that are thriving and that are impacting uh, uh, young families. And that's they're the best neighbors on the block. People who belong to those kinds of churches are good neighbors. Those churches are good neighbors. Those churches that are good neighbors to those around them are growing. They're exploding and bringing people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Helping, inviting, and connecting, and serving. And thinking of that, I mean, how can you be a good neighbor to those around you? Do you know your neighbors? Have you talked with them? Have you prayed with them? Who are the people in your life around you who need help spiritually, relationally, physically? Who are the people in our community? Do we, do we care? Do we care enough to do something? Care enough to give up our cheeseburger? Because the opportunities are endless. I mean, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Man, that's us. These guys were praying for workers. We're the workers. That's us. We can help. We can get involved in our community and help those who are hurting, serve those who are lost, and in doing so, be the light in the presence of Jesus in their lives. When they encounter us, they encounter Jesus in us. I mean, just this last week, I was talking with, uh, with my friend Judy Lyle. You might have seen her around this morning, working here, serving at the church, right? And, and she was talking about this opportunity to raise funds for Grace's Closet through a golf outing on October 16th. Uh, many of you are familiar with Grace's Closet and, and how they help feed hungry kids every week who otherwise wouldn't have food, how they help provide students with decent clothing and, and hygiene items so they feel like they matter. I mean, what an incredible way to get involved in the community, to show kids that they matter to us and they matter to God. Now, I don't know golf is the best way for me to do that because when I go golfing, I'm not like Jesus. I'm just, I'm really bad at golfing. I get frustrated and angry. So, you know, that's not a great thing for me to participate in. But I'll find some other ways to participate. You know, or, or, or you know, think about the other opportunity we had several months back where, you know, we partnered with Habitat for Humanity and, and built homes back in August. And we prayed with people. And we showed them that we cared about them. We showed them the love of Jesus and that they mattered. Right? If you want to help with those, you can talk to Judy. You can talk to Tom. You can call the church office. We'll connect you. Those are just some of the practical ways to get out in our community. Remember the big tornado that came through? And the, the disaster relief, Samaritan's Purse came down and churches partnered together to be out in their community. All different ways that we've demonstrated our ability to help others. And just think, just think how God, how God could work in the 24,000 people lives surrounding our local church in a 10 mile radius how could God work in their lives if we were to be the hands and feet of Jesus? If we were to get out there and help? How could God work in the lives of the 72,000 people here in Oconee County if we saw ourselves as the hand and feet of Jesus to be the solutions to the problems 
that exist in our community. What would happen? What could God do if we said, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to get out there and I am going to help. We see our answer. I asked that question, but we see our answer in 2 Kings 4. After the widow collects all the empty jars, she begins to fill them with olive oil. She begins to fill them with that jar. And when she thinks she's about to run out, she's like, oh, another one got filled. Come and get that one. Okay, one more jar. Oh, that one got filled. What's going on with this thing, right? Fill up another one, you know? And she's like filling up jar after jar after jar after jar, which she had a little bitty in the bottom. And she's like, this is crazy. What's going on? And she's like, bring me another jar. It's coming out. Like, get a hat, a boot or something. Let's keep it going. And finally... They're like, there's no more jars. And then the oil stops flowing. And she goes and she sells it. And there's enough money for her to not only pay off her debt that that she is left with so she can make sure her sons don't have to be indentured servants or sold into slavery. There's enough money left over for them, this family of three, to live off of. The, The truth being, when we're willing to get to work, when we're willing to help, when we're willing to pour out ourselves, God works. God works, and what we think is impossible, he makes possible. You see, he's not only able to meet our financial needs. He's not only able to meet our physical needs and our relational needs, like we see in this text, but ultimately, he meets our greatest need for meaning, purpose, and belonging found in a restored, right relationship with Jesus Christ and the family of God. I'll never forget the, the conversation I had with uh, my former executive pastor uh, back in Fremont, Michigan, uh, Pastor Greg Johnson, that we had the first summer of my internship after I had completed four years at, at uh, Bethany Bible College, now Kingswood University. He says some of my requirements as an intern was to oversee a large-scale ministry event of which I was uh, just super intimidated by because it was for real. Right? I mean, in college, if you don't do well on a test, like you just study harder for the next test, right? That's what you do. But like on the internship, you're dealing with real people and like real lives. And it's not like, it's not like just some like ministry philosophy. It's real. You're dealing with real people, real money, real places, real lives. And, and my job was to oversee a ministry team who put together a, a campaign called the Extreme Home Makeover, in, in which we would kick off on a Sunday uh, morning and be followed by three evening services, all focused uh, on helping families and marriages and relationships thrive. I mean, we had special speakers come in for this. We, we had a promotions team. Um, we, we had uh, all kinds of, of different teams and events teams, and we were dealing with thousands of dollars and hundreds of people, and I was feeling like pressure, I was feeling a lot more pressure than like just giving somebody a cheeseburger. At that moment, I've been like, "Uh, here, take a cheeseburger. I'm like, this is easy, right? But there was a lot more pressure than that. And so in all of the stress leading up to this event, I finally remember going to Pastor Greg feeling quite insecure and just asking him the honest truth. Pastor Greg, what if I fail? What if I fail? And I'll never forget his words. He said to me, Tim, we won't let you fail. And I'll tell you what, there were, those were such incredibly powerful words. And that ministry event went off without any problems, and many lives were influenced, and families were strengthened, and, and God was glorified in that situation. And, and as I think back to that moment about we won't let you fail, that's what we need to realize when, when we're helping people. Is, is we don't need to be afraid of failure. We don't need to be afraid of not doing good enough or not doing right because that's not what transformed people's lives, right? It's not my effort and it's not your effort. It's not our ability to help people that transforms people's lives, but it's God through the Holy Spirit who works in us who transforms lives. And when we partner with him, just like on my internship, just like with Elisha and the widow, he won't let us fail. You can't fail when you take a risk for God. Scripture says in Romans 8.28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Meaning when I partner with Jesus, he's going to accomplish his plan and his purpose 
in my life to bring about good. And so, you know, if, if that's all true this morning, which it is, as we discover in Elisha's story, dare I say, how might we be able to meet the needs of the people in our lives? How might we be able to meet needs through being willing to engage with friends and family and people in our community, our neighbors, our workers, our classmates? What what are you, what are we willing to do for others so that the power and presence of God might be displayed in their life and in our life in a way that would lead people into a deeper relationship with Him? How can we, how can I, how can you use your gift, your talent, How can God use you, use your cheeseburger to make a difference for him? Because God wants to use us to help people. And when we do, there is incredible potential for his outpouring in their lives. People are hurting. We can help. And when we do, God works. A couple of, couple of years ago, I came across a website called blesseveryhome.com. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but if you haven't, I would challenge you to write it down. Get a pen, grab a pen, like write it down on your hand. You don't have a pen, like bite yourself until you bleed. Write it in your blood on your hand, okay? All right, uh, good website, blesseveryhome.com. And it was an online uh, tool designed to equip and help its users to be a spiritual influence in their neighborhoods, to be salt and light in their neighborhood and community. And when you sign up, it gives you 40 homes in your immediate proximity, in your area. It assigns you 40 different homes, gives you the names of these individuals. And it'll send you five emails every like weekday to pray for these five different homes or families in your area. And as you pray for them, you get to click on their home and they start turning up green. And like, so you have this neighborhood, you get to watch visually and all of a sudden houses are turning green as you're praying for these people. And it goes on week after week after week after week. And then the next step is you engage. You begin to help and serve these families. And where there's a need or where you can pray for somebody, you do that. And so as I was praying in my neighborhood with this tool several years ago, somebody would need a ride to school and I would meet that need. And then I could click that house and it would turn yellow. (laughs) Right? So I got a yellow house and all my green. And then somebody needed their, 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 their driveway snow plowed or snow blowed. And I'd go snow blow their driveway. And then I'd click on that house and it would turn yellow. And then, and then like the neighbor down the street, her mom passed away. And I heard about the funeral from my neighbor. And I said, when is that? And he told me. And so I just went and showed up at her funeral. And, and my neighbor saw me there. And we didn't really talk that much. But I had been praying for her. And she said, what brings you here today? And I said, I heard your mom died. I just wanted to love you. And she gave me the most awkward big hug I'd ever experienced in my life. And I got to click on that house, yellow. And all of a sudden, I begin to watch visually how God is working in my neighborhood as I'm praying for people and as I'm connecting with them. And suddenly, opportunities come up for me to have spiritual conversations, for me to pray with people directly. And when that happens, I take the next step and I can click on that house and it turns like red or blue. And so I've got all these houses in my neighborhoods, these 40 groups, 40 different families that are suddenly being impacted for the kingdom of God. It was incredible to watch. It was amazing. And I just wonder this morning, maybe you'd like to take advantage of that tool. Maybe you'd like to get out in your neighborhood and start helping. It could be. It could be through blesseveryhome.com. Maybe. But again, the point is, people are hurting. We can help. And when we help, God works. And so whether it's blesseveryhome.com or whether it's another avenue of of a way of volunteering in the church or out in the community, representing Jesus to those around you, my challenge for you this week is to get out there and do it. To get out there and help. Because God wants to work in your life. And he wants to work in the people's lives around you. Just like with Elisha. And just like the widow.